Welcome back to the show and let's get it underway. And we start from Parliament because it's been exactly one week since the majority in Parliament gave certain ultimatum, uh, requested an emergency sitting, but Speaker Alban Babin is here to reconvey the House. Sources within the majority uh, are alleging that the Speaker will be breaching the Constitution and the sudden orders of the House if it fails to issue a recall order by the close of day today. Now we'll look at the sudden orders of the House shortly, but first let me bring back the Majority Leader Alexander Fenyomark in addressing the news conference on May 3rd, demanding an emergency parliamentary sitting. Our intended recall. Colleagues in the media may be aware of the fact that on the 20th of March, Mr. Speaker adjourned the House Senate Year. At the time the House was adjourned Senate Year, there were three items of urgent importance to government that had been advertised to be taken. They were advertised on the other paper of the day. And these were the items. One, the adoption of the 34th report of the appointment committee on His Excellency the President's nomination for appointment as ministers, regional ministers, and deputy ministers. Two, motion on additional financing agreement between Government of Ghana and the IDA for an amount of $150 million to finance the ongoing Greater Accra Ridge Resilient and Integrated Development Project, also known as the GARID. Three, request for tax exemption for selected beneficiaries under the 1D1F program. On the first item, you all know that Mr. President did some reshuffle and came out with some nomination. As you are well aware, the appointment committee sat on all of the nominees, interviewed them, engaged them, asked the relevant questions, and the report as was tabled on the floor was by consensus. So all we left to do is to take it through the motion of voting. On the issue of the Garrett, that is the IDA 150 million, the committee had done its work. In fact, we had taken the motion and the Works and Housing Subcommittee, Committee of Parliament had expressed certain views and Mr. Speaker advised that the matter be taken back to committee and the leadership of the Works and Housing Committee be um, asked to join to express their views so that said views get incorporated. In fact, this was done, and all that is left is for this uh, item to be taken so that government can um, access uh, this concessional facility to show up our forex. We all know the situation with our city. And these are things that, uh, if we are unable to speedily deal with, would affect our economy. So this is the majority leader in parliament, Alexander Fenyomarkin, last week, Friday, May 3, and made certain demands. And we, all, we, we do understand that they got the required numbers to sign onto a petition that will trigger the necessary provisions in the, in, in, in the Constitution of course, the standing orders of Parliament for the Speaker to undertake emergency recall of the House to consider what they consider to be urgent business uh, of government. Now, Parliamentary Affairs Correspondent Koku Asante joins me in the studio with more on what we are learning. So, Koku, uh, walk us through the provision yes. that, you know, emboldens them to make this demand. Well, Alton, if you look at Article 1123 of the 1992 Constitution, it says, notwithstanding any other provision of this article, 15% of members of Parliament may request a meeting of Parliament, and the Speaker shall, within seven days after the receipt of the request, summon Parliament. That is Article 1123 mm. of the Constitution. This has been repeated in Order 53 of the Standing Orders of Parliament. It says, despite any other provision, 15% of members of parliament may request a meeting of parliament and the speaker shall, within seven days after the receipt of the request, summon parliament. Mm. Parliament shall 
convened within seven days after the issuance within seven of days. the notice of the summons. That is the, the instructions of the order, standing orders of the House, as well as Article 112. If you look at the letter written from the majority leader's office, the memo sent to the speaker, it was written on the 2nd of May, mm -hmm. but actually arrived at the desk of the Speaker of Parliament at 11.43 a.m. on the 3rd of May. That is a Friday, the morning before Alexander Fenyo Markin addressed journalists on why they were recalling Parliament. Mm. Between then and now, it's technically a week because Friday to Friday, but there have been weekends. Right. The two weekends. And the weekend doesn't count. It doesn't count. But if you start counting on a Friday itself that a letter was sent up until today, you have six days. The contention of the majority leadership is that if you purposively interpret within seven days, it says that whatever action the speaker is required to do by virtue of Article 1123, and the 53 of the standing orders mm. must happen within seven days, not on the seventh day or after. This is their interpretation. That is their interpretation. That, that is their understanding of the wording of the constitution and the standing orders, that all this must happen within seven days. Mm -hmm. And so by close of day today, if the Speaker of Parliament does not act and do what is required of him under the standing orders of the House and the Constitution, he will be breaching the Constitution itself mm. and the standing orders of the House. And so they are giving the Speaker of Parliament some more grace that by close of day today, they expect that he would have is issued the notice of summons, recalling members of parliament to come and sit. The question some others have also asked is, even if you issue the summons today, and it's 312, it doesn't seem likely the speaker would do that. Yeah. If he does that on Monday, are MPs expected to come on the same Monday to come and sit, mm. to necessarily fall within that seven-day bracket? That would necessarily mean that things are going to go past the seven days. Mm. And that is why they say that the speaker of parliament is not acting um, as a word with good faith, or at least has also not engaged them since mm. their letters went to his table. We understand the Speaker of Parliament is not currently in the country. He has not been around since Parliament dissolved. He had been in the country a little bit, and then he has traveled for some official duties and that private visit. As we speak, he's currently not there. And I've run checks at the office of the Speaker. Mm. They say the Speaker is not there. They've also not commenced any work at all. To, to get the MPs back in the house. Exactly, regarding commencing MPs. And you've been in Parliament before. You know, it's, it's, it's a bureaucratic process. Right. Recalling MPs, making sure that they need their resources, get to MPs so that they can travel from wherever they may be to come. It's not something that is done in a day or two. It's a day, it's, it takes some quiet process. And that's why the Constitution envisages that and says that all this must be done within seven days. And so the contention here is that given that six days is expiring and by Monday, the seven day itself would have also kick start mm. and will be expiring. The Speaker of Parliament is going beyond the within seven days that is mandated by Order 53 and Article 123 of the Constitution and is breaching the sort of order. And there could be implications. Big implications. If you breach the Constitution in such a flagrant manner, you are committing a high crime. Mm. And that is what the, the Constitution says that if you breach the Constitution in this, in this year. So there is that criminal aspect. Mm. There is also the consequence of being removed from office. So if the president, for instance, uh, I mean, breach the constitution, persons could move a motion for impeachment and get him out. The same way for the speaker. The same too. way for the speaker. Only that, if you look in terms of how it works, the numbers game is a bit, is a bit, mm. is a bit. And that is why some persons within a majority are of the opinion that if the speaker breaches the constitution, it's established to be so. They don't even want to use the process in parliament. They probably will go to the Supreme Court to get a declaration that the speaker has breached the constitution and, and, and in that often has breached his own oath of office that he swore mm -hmm. just by up, upholding the constitution. And then there will be an order that will be made by the Supreme Court that because you've done so, you, you're unable to keep holding on to that office. So there is that real possibility. But already the minority MPs are speaking about what they believe the speaker hasn't done anything. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this may become a political footballing matter of a sort right. with each side holding on to very entrenched positions. And so the Speaker of Parliament... The ball is in his court now, given what we are hearing from the majority side, mm. who are demanding that the Speaker of Parliament recall the House. Our understanding is that the Speaker of Parliament may not do so at all. Mm. And that from some conversation I've had with some members in the majority leadership who have had a conversation with the Speaker, the Speaker did not really plan to recall Parliament on the 21st of May. That well, is when Parliament is said to return from its ordinary recess that it went to. And so... The thinking is that if you come back on the 21st, then I don't have to call an emergency meeting. But there's a reason now. why, there's a reason why th th this provision is in the Constitution exactly. and it's in the Standing Orders and of it, Parliament. In fact, so, uh, I mean, disregarding 
what has been initiated in Parliament will open the grounds for some kind of impeachment, if yes. you like. Yes, and it, it, apart from the, the impeachment angle, then it also means impunity. People can just try and say, these are part of the Constitution I don't disagree with, or I don't like this situation, I won't respect it, I won't, I won't oblige with it. Mm -hmm. And so their concern is that this is a constitutional order. Of course, there's a reason. And so even if Parliament is set to be back, on, be back from their break tomorrow, and someone triggers an emergency sitting the day before a week prior, and there is the space, you need they to call Parliament to come and do that business and not say that because I intend to recall Parliament from this break this week or that week, I'm unable to do so. Let me ask a final question. I mean, you've been, you've been speaking to some members of Parliament. Is there any indication that they've been told to be on standby because they may be asked to come back to the House? Not at all. That? Not at all. In fact, the, when it comes to the majority side, their majority leadership themselves have primed them and say that be on standby any mm. moment from now. When they speak of Parliament issues the summons, we all have to get back to Parliament in our numbers to be able to get the major government business through approval of ministers, loans, tax waivers, and other mm. key government business that have been lagging since the, ha the House was adjourned prematurely by the Speaker at the time. But when it comes to the minorities, I didn't say they don't have any indication. Any indication. And it, it's almost as though you, see, you can just be there until the 21st when the Speaker of Parliament ordinarily will recall the House to come back from their break. So that is the seat of play now, Elsie. All right, so let, 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 let's get some reactions to this. And Roxin Nelson Dafia Mepo, Member of Parliament for South Dai in the Volta region, was also a member of the Constitutional and Legal Affairs Committee of Parliament, says the Speaker has not breached any provision of the 1992 Constitution, nor the standing orders of Parliament. The, in the absence of the Speaker, we have the first Deputy Speaker to, uh, who, who will act. In the absence of the first Deputy Speaker, the second Deputy Speaker will act. Is the Majority Leader saying that in the absence of the Speaker, nobody can act? The first Deputy Speaker is a member of Parliament on the ticket of the NPP. The second Deputy Speaker is a minority, is an independent member of Parliament who is caucusing or doing business with the majority in Parliament. So, so what is their beef? If the Speaker is outside of the jurisdiction, can the first Deputy Speaker act? And if the first Deputy Speaker is unavailable, can the second Deputy Speaker act? They should stop this vile propaganda against the speaker. The speaker, I recall, issued a letter two weeks ago telling them that it's available, it's unavailable to work. They went to sleep. And then they woke up last week to claim that they issued uh, a request for the house to be recalled. If that was sent to the office of the speaker in his absence, I believe that the secretariat of the speaker, which is also made up of the, by the second and first deputy speakers, can act. But the speaker may declare that even in his absence, the house can be successfully recalled. And I believe that they haven't even bothered to read that letter. That is why they will go, they will go to the media and say all sorts of things. But let the record reflect that when the house is properly uh, called upon, for the speaker to recall the house. The appropriate thing would be that. So the call that the speaker, the threat that the speaker is in breach of the constitution is neither here nor there. It is hot air. It is time the majority put their house in order and do the appropriate thing. So let me bring in private legal position Akwe Kupento as we explore this issue and count down to uh, the close of work today. Uh, Lawyer Pencil, it's a pleasure to have you here on the post. Good afternoon. Fine afternoon. Right, so I'm just, I'm just perusing Article 112 of the 1992 Constitution, and the provision is quite clear on under what circumstances Parliament can be recalled for an emergency system. And if you can just, I mean, you, you are familiar with this, but for the benefit of our listeners, it says that uh, notwithstanding any other provision of this article, 15% of members of parliament may request a meeting of parliament and the speaker shall, shall within seven days after the receipt of the request serve on parliament. Now, the request was made on Friday, 3rd May. And today, if we do the calculation minus the weekend, today is a seized day. But the constitution within seven days. Is the majority right in saying that the speaker may be breaching the, this provision in the, in, in the 1992 constitution? I will say... Yes, and I would add that 
we have what we call the letter of the Constitution and also the spirit of the Constitution. Mm. The spirit means or relates or refers to the arrangement by which the letter of the Constitution has brought into being. In other words, in the case that you're talking about, I think the Constitution is very interesting. And therefore, if all the notes, or rather the, the lips notes are given to Peter, and if for some reason he is able to discard the duty of that, then we respect towards whom on him referred master Rupert to Parliament or to whoever commission that quest meet or for the Venus uh, Parliament to explain for Parliament to make that I think I, I think Council, sorry, but the, the, there appears to be some uh, some 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 issue with the line. So we'll try and reconnect again so we can have a better uh, you know, connection to you and hear you uh, clearly on this very important matter. But again, if you just join us here on the Pulse on Joy News, the majority side last week, in Parliament last week, uh, requested an emergency decision of Parliament and they did so by fulfilling Article 112, Clause 3 of the 1992 Constitution, which says that, uh, I mean, 15% uh, of members of Parliament may request a, a meeting of Parliament and the Speaker shall, within seven days after the receipt of the request, summon Parliament. Now, if you do the calculation or the counting, today will be exactly six days instead of the working days minus the weekend. And the majority argument that the, the, the Constitution says shall within seven days. The NDC minority says that the Speaker is, is well within his right to do whatever he is doing. Now, there's no indication that Parliament is being recalled for an emergency setting because MPs have not been told as of now. They're going about their normal duties uh, whilst they enjoy their holiday. And the majority says that they need this recall to allow them to approve some ministers that, that went through vetting but yet to be approved by parliament so that they can do their work assigned to them by the president. And there are also some loan agreements that they need the Parliament to approve of it, and some other business that they consider urgent uh, as of now to see those businesses through. Now, our understanding is that the Speaker had programmed the 21st of May for Parliament to return and continue with business of the House. But the majority is insisting that they require this meeting as early as possible uh, uh, to carry through government business. So, lawyer Okupenso joins us back on the line as we look at. So like, we're making a point about the constitutional provision and its implications. And, uh, see, I'm talking about what we call the letter as mm -hmm. well as the spirit of the constitution. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that a request has properly been made to Peter. But then he's obliged within the constitutional order to indicate, I mean, receive and to take steps to comply and even if he has any reason to believe or to think that the request that's made on him is out of order, mm. then Ketsi will require that he will respond to the request that had been made on him. But if in the circumstances and the context that we find ourselves, my only impression is that even though the request has been made, it has been ignored. Mm. then I would say that that conduct is, a, is contempt of parliament. The conduct where the Speaker of Parliament will refuse to respond in any way whatsoever to a request that has been made on him according to the terms of the Constitution itself and fail or neglect to comment one way or the other mm. or give a reason for his failure or refusal or neglect to abide by the demand that has been made of him, mm. I will only say it's very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate because he cannot remain mute. The duties of his office require that he should communicate directly and respond directly to any request that is brought to him, even if he has reason to disagree 
with that demand. But mm -hmm. I, I find it totally strange and, in, in, in my view, very unfortunate that if what we're hearing on the air is anything to go by, then what, I'm, what, I, what I will conclude is that the Speaker himself is in contempt of Parliament by his deliberate refusal or neglect or failure to respond in any way to an express request that had been made on him by the Constitution itself. I mean, that is, I'm talking about a demand that has been made in accordance mm -hmm. with the terms of the Constitution. That's my view of the matter. But, 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 the, but the point that I was going to make was that, mm -hmm. that what is being played before us fits into the narrative when you go back to the last three or so months, where the Speaker himself initiated a suit in the Supreme Court regarding the, what do you call the it? passage of uh, the anti-LGBT The reaction, bill. more or less, that's the way I'll put it. Right. In reaction to the President's refusal or failure also to accept this uh, LGBTQ uh, bill. bill. And uh, before you heard me on the matter, it was my personal view that what the President did was wrong. That is to say, requesting his secretary to return the bill to Parliament on the sole basis that that matter was before the Supreme Court. Mm. So now, what appears to be playing out in Ghana is a kind of power play. It's a power play that has been done. It's tit for tat and my bid for your this, and that's what is going on. And everything that's going on, in my honest view, is just unfortunate. But somehow, the next question will be, what do we do in the current situation that we find ourselves? Mm. Do we really have to issue a writ in the Supreme Court for a determination as to whether who is doing what and so forth and so forth. Possibly that's the next thing. But it's my honest view that what is going on in Ghana right now between the executive and the legislature, the people who by our votes are supposed to rule and govern us in this country, mm. I think it's, 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 it's anything but desirable. That is my commentary on what is going on. So what is being played out right. to Ghanaians is power politics, power play. Not that the constitution is, is unclear or not that the constitution does not show us what to do. The constitution shows clearly what everybody must do, but somehow that becomes very convenient in the midst of the power politics that are being played in this country for everybody to decide what, 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 what he wishes to do. So me, that's my commentary on what is going on now. All right, There's no debate or dispute mm. as to the legality or of the demand that they made on the speaker. And if he refuses to do it in the manner that he does it, that is to say, just ignore it. I would just call it unfortunate. I don't know whether we really, really bargain for this. Let me, as, let, as, let, as, as, as Ghanaian, yeah. I, I really don't know. Yeah. Council, let me come in here. The constitution makes reference to the speaker. Uh, there's no mention of, I mean, the, the role the deputies can play in this, in this direction. Now, uh, w we've done our own checks. There is nothing in motion to suggest that the MPs have been put on notice to be in readiness to return to the House to consider what the majority considers to be an urgent matter. So clearly, uh, today is going to end, and there will be nothing from Parliament recalling the, 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 the members to come back to the House. If the speaker is out of the country, unless it directs the deputy speakers, is it your understanding that nothing can happen? No, the point I'm making is that our constitution is broad enough, our constitution is clear enough. In fairness, I mean, it's not the presence of the speaker in Ghana alone, which is perfect or which is a requirement for the queen of the of parliament. It's not the case. We have two deputy speakers standing. And the future president is able for how they are going to this of our parliament. Let no one say or tell us that if the speaker is physically absent from Ghana, mm. the business of parliament can be done. It can never be the case. I mean, come on, that would have been short sightedness on the whole of the people of this country and on behalf of the people who formulated and we passed this constitution to be in. The clear provisions are there. They are there. And so the speaker. If for some reason, for instance, it's not going to be around for the next one year, I was suggesting that we need to politicize, install a new speaker before Parliament can do this. It's not true. So that's why I'm saying that even if, even, even, even if we had a constitution 
that spoke like that, I would say that that will be the letter. But the spirit of the Constitution requires that there must be business. Let me give you an illustration which may not be too pointed mm. to the issue. You remember what happened in Ghana during the COVID time? Right. We had an executive instrument that were issued that governed our relationship to what was going on and people were found wanting and people were arrested and whatever. Mm. Only for the Supreme Court after the COVID period to declare that those executive instruments were contrary to law. Right. But nonetheless, the time that the executive instruments were in place, they worked. They did something. They guided and guided us in everything that we did. And that's what I talk about the spirit of the Constitution. So I zoom in for the sake of our discussion that the, I mean, the speaker alone is the one who can give commands or who can preside over parliament or the particular business that we're talking about. Come on. We've gone far beyond this kind of politics for us to say that the physical presence of the speaker will be required in Ghana for the doing of business of parliament. I don't, I've never understood the constitution or any of provision of the constitution to suggest that. But what is going on, you see, I want us to put it in proper context. Mm. I say it is power play. And how do we deal it with this power, power play? Politics. How do we deal with this? And that is my view of the matter. I'm asking how, how do we deal with this power play? Because ultimately, it is a Ghanaian that suffers as of the course. executive and legislator fight. Of course. So anybody can go to court. You see, what has happened is that now our, our Supreme Court is going to be loaded with just about everything. Mm. And I regret it very much that it has to be so. But even if it means that somebody has to go to the Supreme Court to seek a clear interpretation of the law in relation to the facts that are unfolding, then of course we'll be guided and then we will know. Next time we'll know whether everything that I said whether they are well founded or I'm just hallucinating, and then we'll properly be guided. That's will you take, how we get will you take, will you take up that tax? Council, will you take up that tax? Come again. I'm asking whether you will take up this tax. <laughs> you know why I'm laughing. Uh, you tell me. You know it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is why we say top government official refuses to comment. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, private welcome. legal practitioner Kweku Pinto making the point that somebody must head to the Supreme Court to bring some sanity to what is happening. For him, this is clear power play between the executive and the legislature. Now, today is the sixth after, after the majority side made a demand on the speaker for an emergency recall of the House so that government can put before the House some urgent business. Now, the day is almost over. There is no indication that the Speaker of Parliament is going to uh, see to the demand of the majority side in Parliament. Because from our checks, MPs have not been told to come back to the House because a recall of this nature requires an elaborate plan. Those who are out of the country must be brought back into the country. The Parliament must pay for their airfare. Wherever an MP is, it will be the responsibility of Parliament to make the finances available to bring them to the House and then pay for the inconvenience that they will saddle them through as a result of this emergency recall. Such plan is not in motion yet, meaning that it will take days if the speaker will respond to the majority for this to happen. But the constitution is clear, within seven days, and for some people, it ends today. Some people say that we will have to wait till Monday. Whatever it is, we're, we're keeping a close eye uh, on this matter and we'll bring you developments as they unfold. But I'm waiting.